Well, good morning, everybody. We continue our studies in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 31. I want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. Trust and pray everyone had an awesome holiday. And we'll begin our studies in the 31st chapter. Its theme is the change of leadership from Moses to Joshua. I heard about a leader who spoke before a team of young workers. And after the speech, he sat down and he asked his wife, how did I do? And she said, well, you did all right, but you missed several good opportunities to sit down. <laughs> well, here in Deuteronomy 31, it's time for Moses to sit down. It's time for him to pass the baton of leadership over to the next generation. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Joshua to succeed Moses. Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all Israel. I am now 120 years old. That's pretty good. Now that's nothing compared to the lifespans at the beginning of Genesis before the flood. Adam lived to be 930 years old. And Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. Noah himself, 950 years old. Well, how come we don't see that today? Well, I think initially, we think of 900 as a long time, but in reality, God intended us to live forever. So from the eternal perspective, 900 years is not what God had planned. He planned for even more than that. He planned for eternal life, not a 900-year life. But as sin and disease and immorality and infidelity spread, lifespans got shorter. Now, Psalm 90, verse 10 says, man's days are 70 years or 80 if he has the strength. If you make it past 80, you're doing pretty good. And even in the United States, I think the average lifespan is 77 or 78 for a man and 81 for a woman. So to make it to 120 in our time, you know, is super phenomenal. And and Moses is a healthy 120. He's still pretty spry. Remember, when he goes up to the mountain to die in Deuteronomy 34, he walks up there by himself. He's not using a cane. He's not using any assistance, so to speak. He, he's doing it under his own power. So Moses says, I'm now 120 years old, and I am no longer able to lead you not necessarily because of any physical incapacities, but because God says you're no longer able to lead the people. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. Now earlier, God had told Moses he will not bring the congregation into the promised land. Now, more specifically, he's saying you yourself are not even going to cross over at all. And then it says in verse 3, the Lord your God himself will cross over the head of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and you will take possession of their land. Joshua also will cross over ahead of you, as the Lord said. And the Lord will do, do to them what he did to Sihon and Og, back in the first chapter of Deuteronomy, the king of the Amorites, whom he destroyed along with their land. Actually, the third chapter of Deuteronomy. The Lord will deliver them to you, and you must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So Moses spoke these words to Israel, and he spoke these words to Joshua. Seven times Joshua hears the words. Be strong and courageous. And the last time we hear the words, be strong and courageous in connection with Joshua and Joshua chapter 10, he's telling other people to be strong and courageous. So you can strengthen others with the strength that you have received from God. So Joshua is the one's going to lead him there. God holds leaders to a higher standard, and he would not let Moses bring them into the promised land. 
because Moses disobeyed God at the waters of Meribah in Numbers chapter 20. God told them to speak to the rock and water would come out. But Moses said, must we bring you water? And he struck the rock twice. And we know from 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4 that the rock represents Christ. Jesus didn't need to be struck twice. He needed to be struck once on the cross. So Moses was unnecessarily harsh with the rock. He was trying to use it as a show of his strength rather than obeying God. He yelled at the people unnecessarily. And because leaders are judged more strictly, James 3 verse 1, God judged Moses strictly and said, there's going to be an end to your leadership before you get to the promised land. It is what it is. Makes me think, wow, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm a leader. <laughs> you know, I got to make sure I'm walking the talk. I'm reading a novel now that's dealing with politics in Chicago in the 1960s. And it's amazing how crooked those people were even back then. And then I'm thinking about the text and how the leaders are held to a higher standard. And, oh, my goodness, what's going to be in store for crooked, immoral, unethical people holding positions of power? What it's going to be like for them in the afterlife? Well, Moses was one of the greatest men Israel ever had, and he still was not able to bring him into the promised land. But God promises he will be with Joshua and with the people. Verse 7, Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous. You must go with this people into the land. You must divide it among them as their inheritance. Verse 8, The Lord himself goes before you. You know, we're very well aware of the fact that we're with God when we go to church, but are we well aware of the fact that God is with us even when we leave church, that we need to live holy lives even outside the church? God will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The writer of Hebrews is going to quote this later on in Hebrews 13, verse 5, because he has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now we move in verse 9 to one of the last ceremonies of Moses' life, the public reading of the Torah, the public reading of the law. Once every seven years, there needs to be a congregation a coming together of all the people of Israel. And the Torah is read to them and taught to them. It's kind of a marathon Bible lesson once every seven years. It was so important that every single Israelite, every seven years, be reminded of the Word of God. Now, this is different from a regular worship service. There are regular worship services and holy days where the Torah is read, but this is one in which all of it is read. And it would be time consuming. But God says every generation, well, every seven years, there's got to be this. Verse 9 So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the law the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, in the year for canceling deaths, during the festival of tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, you will read this law before them in their hearing. Assemble the people, men and women and children and foreigners residing in your towns, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. We all know people that probably only go to church once every year or once every couple of years. So this is a service for the people that don't go all that often. So they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God. Verse 13, their children who do not know this law must hear it. People need to hear the word of God and learn to fear the Lord your God. 
as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. I read the Bible to get close to God, but also I develop a healthy, reverent fear of God when I read the Bible. And I think that's another thing Bible reading does. It reminds us of the awesomeness and holiness of God. So like the text says, we learn to fear him. Verse 14, Israel's rebellion predicted. This is the passing of the baton. The exchange of leadership is about to happen from Moses to Joshua. You know, a lot of churches and organizations do not plan for the future. They may have had a very successful pastor for 25 or 30 or 40 years, and they have thrived under the leadership of that one leader, but they haven't adequately planned for the future so that there can be an exchange of leadership. Some churches have done this well. Some have not done so well. When D. James Kennedy retired from the Coral Gables Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, there was a gulf of leadership. That congregation really went through some rough times because they hadn't adequately prepared a successor. I mean, when you have somebody that's kind of a living legend like Pastor Kennedy, you need to plan carefully. It, it's probably a good idea for the leader to work, the future leader to work alongside the current leader so there can be a smoother transition. That's why Joshua was such a good pick, because he was with Moses. He was his assistant. He was with them on the mountain. He was with them at the bottom of the mountain. And so it's so important to plan that ahead. I've worked that out with the consistory that should the day come, when it's time for me to be thinking about retirement, that we would look for a replacement and maybe I could work alongside the replacement for a couple of years. And then after that, there could be a passing of the baton, like what we see in Deuteronomy. I think that's the right way to do it. I feel bad for congregations that maybe their pastor died unexpectedly or they haven't adequately planned for the future so that they're hurting. God knew that this was going to be an issue. The Lord said to Moses, now the day of your death is near. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting where I will commission him. So Moses and Joshua came and presented themselves at the tent of meeting. Verse 15, the Lord appeared at the tent in a pillar of cloud and the cloud stood over the entrance to the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, you're going to rest with your ancestors and these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. And in that day, they'll become angry with them and forsake them. I'll hide my face from them and they'll be destroyed. So God is predicting the future that there's not going to be easy times. There's going to be hard times. And because the people are turning to other gods, verse 18, I will certainly hide my face in that day because of all their wickedness. In turning to other gods. Verse 19, now write down this song and teach it to the Israelites. That's Deuteronomy 32. Moses is going to write a national anthem talking about what he's going to do to them if they don't listen. That's a whole lot different than, oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. You know, our national anthem is pretty inspiring. You go to the National Anthem of Deuteronomy 32. We're going to look at that tomorrow. Holy man. But God knows that sometimes we learn better by putting words to music. So he's going to have Moses write a song. So it may be a witness for me against them. Verse 20, when I brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised on oath to their ancestors, and when they eat their fill and thrive, they will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me, breaking my covenant. Verse 21, and when many disasters and calamities come on them, this song will testify against them because it will not be forgotten by their descendants. I know what they're disposed to do even before I bring them into the land. God says, I know what's in a man. Remember what Jesus said in John 2, 24, he did not entrust himself to any man, for he knew what was in a man. Well, God's the Father's the same way. I know these people are fickle and faithless 
and prone to wander. Verse 22, so Moses wrote down this song that day and taught it to the Israelites. You know, sometimes people say, Mark, I can't memorize Bible verses. It's too hard. And then I ask them to quote their favorite song and they can do it word perfect. So it's, a, it's appropriate and good to put the words of God to music like Moses is doing. Verse 23, the Lord gave this command to Joshua, son of Nun, be strong and courageous. There it is again. For you will bring the Israelites into the land. I promised them on oath and I myself will be with you. Well, why is he saying it to him again? Because we need to hear it again. We forget. You know, in a, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the feeding of the 4,000 in Mark chapter 8. And the people are forgetting so quickly what Jesus did when he fed the 5,000. They even ask the same dumb questions. Where in this remote place are we going to get enough food to feed these people? It's like what God did back then is what God did back then. But this is today. This is a whole new situation. And I don't have the assurance of knowing that God's going to come through again. And so we need the constant reminder that we need to be strong and courageous and that God is with us. Verse 24, after Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. You know, they've already got the Ten Commandments in there. Now Moses is saying, I want you to put the whole Torah in. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There it will remain as a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you have been rebellious against the Lord while I'm still here, how much more will you rebel after I die? You know, Moses knows the people too, doesn't he? Assemble before me all the elders of your tribes and all your officials, so that I can speak these words in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to testify against them. For I know that after my death, you are sure to become utterly corrupt and to turn from the way I have commanded you. In days to come, disaster will fall on you because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord and arouse his anger by what your hands have made. And Moses recited the words of this song from beginning to end, in the hearing of the whole assembly of Israel. You know, one thing I've noticed that I've gotten as I've gotten older is that I'm less concerned about how other people might react if I'm speaking truthfully from the heart. You know, sometimes we worry too much about what other people think and we hold back from expressing our concerns. And Moses is at the end of his life, and he's like, man, I am not holding back. Even though this is the last speech I'm ever going to give, I'm going to tell the people that they're stubborn anyway. <laughs> I'm going to tell the people that they're probably not going to listen to me after I'm gone. Holy cow. You know, that's not usually the textbook example of how to give a final speech to a congregation. But Moses could only speak what God put on his heart. So there you have it. The passing of the baton. Moses handing off leadership to Joshua. And I think the takeaway for us is that at least here at Peace Church in Potter, we got an annual meeting coming up and we need to pray to God that we're going to have one person who's going off the board after six years of faithful leadership. We need to pray that God raises up another leader somebody who will be strong and courageous, somebody who will be devoted to the word of God. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We'll be back tomorrow with Deuteronomy chapter 32, the Song of Moses. You guys have a great day.